One of the most accomplished real estate developers in New York City's history has just closed the door on a very long and dramatic divorce. With he and his ex-wife's extensive art collection passing through the Sotheby's auction block, achieving a shocking $922 million in total sales. Today we are talking about Harry Macklow, a man who has been developing billion dollar projects out in New York since 1960. And after over 60 years in the business, he has has had his name associated with some big projects around town, like the Apple Cube at the General Motors building, the Metropolitan Tower at 57th Street, One Wall Street off of Wall Street and Broadway, and of course, one that he's most known for as of recently, 432 Park Avenue. I've been following Macklow's work for a while now, and we've already covered a few of his big projects here on the channel, but the divorce proceedings that just wrapped up really did shed some light on his financial position after spending so many years as a Manhattan developer. One thing that was revealed through all of this is that, oddly, almost all of Harry Macklow's entire net worth was tied up in this collection of 65 pieces of art that he and his ex-wife were forced to sell over the last six months. In today's episode, we are going to talk about who Harry Macklow is and his impressive real estate development resume. And then, of course, we're going to dive into this insane art collection of his that fetched almost a billion dollars at auction. So Harry Macklow's story is fascinating for a number of reasons, but his perseverance is something that I'm personally drawn to above anything else. See, like I said at the start of the video, Harry started developing real estate in Manhattan back in 1960, but when the financial crisis of 2008 hit, he was way too over leveraged on way too many deals, and he just about lost everything, including a total of seven massive projects that he had on his plate at the time. Being beat down by the financial crisis didn't stop Harry from finding his place in New York City history, though, because even though he defaulted on around $7 billion worth of loans and lost around $50 million of his own money back then, he emerged from this speed bump in his development career and went on to take on even bigger projects like 432 Park Avenue and One Wall Street. The life of a luxury real estate developer is fascinating, especially when you're looking at a developer like Maclow Properties, who's building these skyscrapers in New York. It's kind of crazy when you realize that all somebody like Harry needs to master is first First, finding a good piece of land or building that can be renovated. Then next, finding a bank who's willing to lend him millions or billions of dollars to do the project. After that, he needs to put together a team of architects, engineers, and contractors to help him execute his vision. And then last, he needs to either sell or rent the place out, hopefully making millions every time. Most of the criticism that Harry Macklow gets out in New York is related to just kind of the style and the architecture of the buildings that he's putting up because they don't technically fit into the New York City skyline. I mean, if you look at the Metropolitan Tower at 57th Street, this is a 68-story building that definitely has a more modern aesthetic with this black glass facade and triangle shape. Or look at 432 Park Avenue, which is another one that's been making headlines for years for a number of reasons, but a lot of people didn't like the simplistic and boxy design, although I personally think this building is awesome. Or another one of controversy is a proposed building of Macklow's called Tower Fifth, which also has a box look to it and then it's got this cantilevering observation deck at the top. Love these buildings or hate them, you have to respect the hustle that a developer like this has and the fact that he's totally fine pushing the envelope a little bit from an architectural standpoint. With all of these big high-rise projects that Harry Macklow has been involved in over the course of his lifetime, he has often been referred to as a billionaire because when you're building out multi-billion dollar buildings, you basically have to be a billionaire, right? Well, it turns out that these divorce proceedings are shedding a little bit more light on Harry Macklow financial position and he's definitely crazy rich but he's nowhere near a billionaire especially after the divorce this all started about three years ago when Harry's wife Linda filed for a divorce initially which kicked off one of the highest profile divorce proceedings in New York City history the two were happily married or maybe not so happily married for 57 years until Linda ultimately filed for divorce after Harry left her for a younger woman Harry and Linda of course owned some luxury real estate they they owned some commercial rental property, and they owned a $23 million yacht. But the bulk of their net worth, somewhere around 90% of it, was tied up in this art collection. When it comes to diversifying your assets, most financial advisors don't like to see somebody who's in their 70s or their 80s with more than 30% of their net worth in one asset class. So it's pretty crazy to see them have this much money tied up in art, but whatever, it's their money, they
they can do what they want with it. Both Harry and Linda have been art collectors for most of their adult lives, but their prized collection of 65 pieces that recently went to auction are said to have been selected almost exclusively by Linda. Apparently, Linda had kind of turned art collecting into a full-time job, visiting art galleries and networking with art experts all day, every day. This ended up being a very good investment of Linda's time, though, because the art collection that was just auctioned off is now being said to have been the greatest private collection of art ever seen. Sadly though, since both Harry and Linda could not agree on the value of each one of these pieces, the judge as a part of their divorce proceedings demanded that they sell everything at auction and then split up whatever the proceeds were in half. Now guys, I don't know anything about art other than the fact that I like the way that some art looks and I don't like the way that other art looks, but we just have to look at some of these pieces that sold at auction together because it blows my mind just how much some people are willing to pay pay for some paint on canvas. 65 pieces in total were auctioned off, but today we're just going to look at some of the ones that I thought were the most interesting or my favorite. All right, so the first one up here is Lot 19. This one is an original by Andy Warhol. I'm sure all of you guys have heard of him before. They call this piece Nine Marilyns. It's acrylic, silkscreen, ink, and graphite on canvas. I guess Warhol created this thing in 1962. It is 207 by 86 centimeters in size. They say the Maclows acquired this one in 1996. Unfortunately, they don't tell us how much they paid for it, but it sold for $48,522,000. So this next one is Lot 9. This one is done by an artist named Willem de Kooning. This is an untitled piece, and it's just oil on canvas. I guess Kooning did this piece in 1961. It's 203 by 178 centimeters in size, and the Maclows acquired this piece in 1983. Again, we don't know how much the Maclows paid for it, but this one sold for $17,789,300. I just cannot believe that something like this sells for so much money. Again, I know nothing about art, but I feel like I could whip something like this up in a Sunday afternoon. All right, and next up we have an exciting one. I believe this was the most expensive piece that sold. This one is Lot 7 by Mark Rothko. It's called Number 7, Oil on Canvas. They estimated that this piece would sell above $70 million. It ended up going for $82,468,500. There's a little more detail on this auction. Apparently, this is not the most expensive piece by this artist. That one went for $87 million in 2012, but there's a lot of interest for this one. Apparently there were 10 bids in total, so there was a little bit of a bidding war happening, but someone ended up coming out on top and wow. They spent a fortune for basically three colors on canvas. And the next one up by an artist named Cy Twombly. It's another untitled piece, and they're saying that it's acrylic and crayon on wood panels in six different parts. It was created in 2007, which is exactly when the Maclows bought it in 2007. They thought that this one would sell for about 40 million bucks. It ended up going for 58 million 863,000 dollars. 58 million bucks is a ton of money, but super cool piece. Next up, we have Lot 7 by Picasso. This is obviously not wall hanging art. This one's a sculpture figure. Picasso created this piece in 1962. It was picked up by the Maclos in 1995. And this one sold at auction for $27,265,500. It's just a bunch of welded steel. I'm sure I could go to one of my local welders and have this piece whipped up for a few thousand bucks. But clearly this is where the more sophisticated side of the art scene goes over my head. This piece is worth something because of who it came from, when it was made, why it was made, all that. It has nothing to do with the materials or how difficult it was to make. I couldn't find any reliable reports on exactly how much the Maclos spent on this art collection to figure out exactly how much profit they made from this sale. But since they've been collecting for the past 50 or 60 years, and since they caught some of these artists before their rise to fame, something tells me that the $922 million that they just fetched at auction is way more than they paid for all these pieces over the years. If you enjoyed the episode today, guys, hit that thumbs up button down below or leave a comment. That really helps the channel out a lot. And remember to subscribe as well if you're not already a subscriber. I'm putting new videos just like this one out every week, but that's all I've got for you guys this time. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!